Hello, and welcome to our webinar today, Reengineering Re Your Workforce for the COVID-19 Era and Beyond. So glad to have all of you with us today for our first Executive Roundtable from ePay Systems. My name is Michelle Lanter-Smith, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer at ePay Systems. I want to thank all of you again for joining us and uh, thank our customers that are here with us today. We're so proud to have you with us and, and, and honor your presence. So thank you so much. With me today is Dr. Stephen Davis. He is, will be our moderator. And again, we're very excited to have him too. Dr. Davis is a professor of economics and international business at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He's an applied economist who studies business dynamics, worker outcomes, economic uncertainty, public policy, and of course a lot more. He is also the co-founder of the Economic Policy Uncertainty Project, the Survey of Business Uncertainty, and the Stock Market Jumps Project. He co-organizes the Asian Monetary Policy Forum, and I also know that he works with the Atlanta Federal Reserve Board. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here. You know, before we get started, Steve, I would like to just take our listeners through uh, a few housekeeping tips. We have a lot of you on the phone today, and we want to try to get to all your questions, and of course, we want to hear our panelists and, and Dr. Davis speak and give, them, give us some of their thoughts and opinions about how to move forward. We are going to ask you a few questions, though, too, and those are polling questions. Super easy. When you see them pop up, just tap it on your keyboard what you think so that we can get your opinions too. But when you do have a question for our speakers, our panelists, Dr. Davis, if you go to the right side of your screen, you'll see a question box. Just type it in. I'm going to be moderating. I'm going to be not moderating, but I'm going to be watching those questions. And I'll pose them to Dr. Davis uh, pretty much more at the end of our session today. All right. Now, you will receive the slides from today. You'll also see, uh, receive an executive summary of the research that we did that many of you partook, partook in um, after our session. Probably in about a few days, we need to get it pulled together because uh, it's going to include some of the comments that, and questions that you guys talk about today. So again, let's get going. Just a little bit about ePay. Again, many of you know who we are, but many of you are new to ePay and ePay Systems and what we do. We're here in Chicago, headquartered here, and we're a human capital management firm specializing in all that you need to basically manage your workforce, track their time, pay, and of course, onboard and manage those folks. We are the industry leader in time and labor management for companies that have a distributed workforce. Those are employers that have their folks moving around from job site to job site, company to company, or actually have a very complex type of workforce in terms of their rules. Union rules, CBAs, ship differentials, you got it. Our time and labor management is flexible to handle that. We also have great customer support because we know that time and labor management, as well as the whole human capital management process, can be challenging at times. And for that, we've received a lot of awards. Down below, you can see some of the logos and some of our customers that we are really proud to support. So let me introduce to you our panelists, because again, we want to get started. Again, thank you to all of you that have joined us. The first I'd like to introduce is Adriano Padrelli. Adriano is a successful business leader with experience in small to mid-sized companies. To, uh, recently, he has been the president and CEO of Waste Dry, an eco-friendly wastewater disposal company, which acquired Interpipe that eventually led to the inception of Impact Polymer. He is now serving his clients by helping them navigate through COVID and dealing with today's issues in the workforce. He's also on the advisory board of the Global Chamber. Welcome, Adriano. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Next is Anthony Scaglioni. Anthony is the Executive Vice President and CFO at ABM Industries, a Fortune 500 company and provider of facility solutions. Anthony is responsible for enterprise finance, tax, IT, and mergers and acquisitions. 
He's also a customer of ePix, and we're so glad to have him with us. He's been with ABM for over 10 years. Welcome, Anthony. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Brooke Tapshori. Brooke is, practices employment and labor law at Duane Morris. She has extensive experience counseling and advising clients in employment law issues, drafting employment policies, and providing employment training and harassment training, especially in California, where she's based. During the last few months, however, she has become an expert in COVID-19 and the legal issues associated with it, with it and she spends mo all of her time counseling her clients, doing webinars like this, and helping um, folks around the nation manage through this. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you. And finally, we have Jacob Soon. Jacob has been with Airgain, a manufacturer and leading provider of advanced antenna technology since 2006. He is currently the president and CEO at Airgain. He brings over 20 years of domestic and international business development and management experience to Airgain and is responsible for the strategic direction, operations, and growth of the com company. So welcome all of you. We really appreciate you taking this time today to uh, give us your thoughts and opinions on how you've dealt with COVID. I want to turn it over, though, to Steve Davis. Uh, thanks again, Michelle. Um, I'm also quite excited to be here and to share the virtual stage with you uh, and our distinguished panelists. I'm eager to hear what they have to say and to uh, interact with uh, our audience. Um, as Michelle mentioned, um, we conducted a survey in advance of this uh, webinar. Uh, we'll come back to it a few times, and I wanted to just share with you at the outset um, a few results about the character of the survey, and I'll, I'll give two headline results from the survey. This slide just gives you a sense of the size and the composition of the survey. So we had 121 respondents, uh, nearly half of them from the manufacturing sector, nearly a third from the business services contracting sector, and the rest from a variety of other sectors. And as you can see on that little chart, bar chart on the left, we've got you know, some smaller firms, mostly mid-sized firms, and then a few larger firms in the survey. So two headline results that came out of the survey that I think are important context for our discussion. Um, if you could advance to show the next slide, um, we asked firms how they thought COVID-19 uh, would affect their sales uh, revenues in 2020, in 2020. Okay, this uh, histogram kind of shows the distribution of the outcomes. Um, not surprisingly, there's a big, there's a widespread. Um, there are a substantial number of firms who see the pandemic is actually increasing their 2020 sales, but the balance is to the negative side. And if you take an average number, um, it's about minus seven percent uh, down on sales for the year as a consequence of the virus. And if you weight firms by their size, it's down by about minus 10%. Okay, so that's a pretty big hit. Now we also asked firms um, how they thought, uh, what, they, what they thought their headcount would be at the beginning of next year relative to what it was at the beginning of this year. So if we get, we, yeah, so, so here what we see is also a wide range of responses, somewhat to the downside, but the key takeaway from this slide is the employment contractions that firms anticipate from the virus are smaller than their sales contractions. And what that says to me is that these firms expect much of the downturn associated with the pandemic to begin to diminish by 2021. And so for that reason, they want to keep their workforce in place in the expectations that the economy will recover if not fully, at least significantly. And I think now uh, we're going to have our first little audience poll. And so here I'll turn it back to Michelle, who will conduct that little poll for you. All right, so here we go. The poll is open. The question for all of you is, regarding reengineering your workforce for the COVID-19 time, for now and beyond, what are your primary concerns? Is it really uh, the hourly, your f workforce, your hourly workforce, that's your front line and your production workers? Is it B, your back office staff, or is it C, your, or both? Okay, so that it is coming in. 
And what we see, 50% is both, but 40% say frontline and 10% say back. So this really helps us to understand in our panelists really what your concerns are today so we can make sure we direct our, our comments to that. Okay, let's move on then. Okay, so, um, so we see there's a lot of concern there, but especially on the front line and uh, production workers. So here's our first question for the panelists. Um, what strategies are you taking to control direct and indirect labor costs uh, for the next few months? And perhaps you might also want to speak to what factors are kind of inhibiting your ability to control costs as well as you'd like. And I, I'd like to first uh, turn it over to Anthony uh, and get his uh, perspective uh, on this issue from, from ABM. Take it away, Anthony. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, so just to give some perspective, uh, direct labor compromises roughly 90% of our 130,000 plus workforce and approximately 80% of our fully burdened costs. So as you can imagine, both pre and post pandemic, it's a critical line item that we manage. Um, and we specifically look at the labor hours and the billings associated with that labor hours. Um, aside from that, uh, we've taken cost actions across areas by furloughing uh, certain employees, reducing discretionary spend levers, uh, reducing salaries across certain corporate functions, and obviously we're also benefiting from reduced travel and entertainment costs that typically we would be incurring uh, had the pandemic not hit. Um, this is all fed by costs that we see increasing uh, in, in terms of personal protection equipment that we've invested in, investments that we're making, uh, in training uh, and marketing. Um, so for us, it's continuing to manage that frontline direct labor cost because that's uh, the bread and butter of our business, uh, making sure that uh, safety for our frontline workers are first and foremost the most important priority, and making sure we're staying close to our customers to ensure we have a good understanding of their demand um, and appropriately adjusting our labor uh, associated with any shifts in that demand. Okay, so a lot to think about there, including close contact with customers to try to figure out how to serve their needs uh, most cost effectively. Jacob, maybe you can take up this question as well and, and uh, uh, give us your perspective um, working and leading at Airgain. Yeah, th thank you, Steve. So Airgain, we primarily manufacture and design antenna systems globally. So for us, uh, the impact has been minimal so far. Uh, we have actually provided our employees uh, with harder bonus that we actually saw this as an opportunity to help motivate and retain our employees during the crisis. Now, uh, as far as uh, how we're managing uh, our indirect and direct labor costs going forward, we actually uh, have our own manufacturing facilities out of Arizona where most of our drug laborers reside. Also, we're using contract manufacturers out of China. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is to have a balanced strategy uh, between the, our own uh, factory and our international contract manufacturers. So we're going to make sure that the, the production demand is going to be uh, shared among the two, uh, and this really helps control our labor costs overall uh, from an internal and external uh, factory perspective. Jacob, if, if you needed to alter the layout of your factory, your factory layout uh, in order to maintain social distancing, or was it all, did it already have a layout that lent itself to social distancing? Well, as far as social distancing, you know, we have definitely, you know, abided by the, the guidelines, right? So we actually adapt uh, multiple shifts within our own factory. So that way, instead of doing just one shift, we're doing two. So to ensure that there's they social distancing uh, within you know, the, the, the factory. In addition, we are actually uh, mandatory our employees to wash their hands every two hours and, hmm. and, and you know, just uh, wear the mask at all times uh, as a way to uh, ensure that you know, uh, minimizing the potential impact with that, the, the, the pandemic. Thanks, thanks, Jacob. And you know, Brooke, that's a good good time to turn turn to you. And uh, you know, Jacob just spoke about some of the things that uh, AB, ABM is Airgain is requiring uh, their employees to do. 
<clears throat> obviously, there are lots of things employers might require of their employees in an effort to uh, um, minimize the risk of spreading the virus. And they can, in principle, ask employees to conduct themselves in certain ways when they're even not on the job. Can you talk about the legal issues that arise there? What, what's within scope that employers can do and can't do? And you know, what are the risks that they run into? And there's a lot to think about there. There's definitely a lot to think about. And from a legal perspective, we're in a bit of uncharted territory. Um, I don't, none of us saw this coming six months ago, and none of us thought we'd be here at the start of the year. Um, and that's the, the issue, is keeping the workplace safe. Um, a big um, thing is we have all these new requirements that state, local governments, the federal CDC are putting out there and saying to employers, you must do this immediately. And that's the challenge is you have to keep to try to keep your business running while also complying with these. Um, one challenge for employers is that, you know, employees will not come to the workplace if they don't feel safe. That's the long and the short of it. And the way you keep the employees safe in the workplace is to try to keep those who have been infected or at risk for infection, um, who are symptomatic but may not have been diagnosed, away from other employees. And that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, so, you know, like uh, you were mentioning, um, changing the layout of the workplace, social distancing, that's more important than ever, and in many jurisdictions is actually required. Um, where I practice in California, and specifically where I live and work, San Diego, you're actually required to publish a plan for how you're going to social di socially distance your workplace, you post your cleaning schedule, how are you going to keep employees six feet apart, one-way traffic in hallways, isolating different buildings, things like that. And then there's additional work uh, legal considerations as well uh, that go beyond what to do in the workplace. Um, for example, can you police what your employees do outside of work? Generally speaking, you cannot, but you can ask about it. So, for example, you can't prohibit your employees from traveling for personal reasons, but you can, you can warn them, if you do travel, you have to tell us about it, and we're going to probably be sending you home for two weeks in a quarantine to make sure that you're safe before coming back to the workplace. If employees are sick, you want them to tell you about it. And if they don't tell you, and if you make it difficult or complicated, or if they think they're going to be outed as sick, they're not going to tell you about it. If they think that they're going to lose income, they're probably not going to tell you about it. So it's about kind of refocusing your relationship with your employees, if you haven't already, toward how can we make it easy and safe for them to disclose if they have a circumstance or a health condition that puts them at higher risk for infecting other employees so that we know about it and can keep the rest of the workplace safe. With regard to other legal considerations, it is important to remember that even though we're in a pandemic, that hasn't been seen in over a century. Um, the employment laws have not been suspended. You know, equal employment opportunity laws, EEO laws are still in force and effect. Wage and hour laws are still in force and effect. So it's important to keep in mind that if you're furloughing, if you are um, playing employees off, do that EEO analysis. Are certain uh, protected classes of employees being disproportionately effective? And if so, how do we fix that? Because it's the, the laws prohibiting such disparate impacts are still in effect. Have you complied with the federal or, uh, if applicable, a state WARN Act law that requires a certain amount of notice to employees? Back in March, it was absolutely unforeseeable and it was impossible to give 60 days notice, which is required under most statutes. Now, at the end of June, it might be harder to make that argument that it was unforeseeable. Let me, I just, you had a lot to say there, but, but two things that came up that I can't resist asking about. You described two circumstances under which employees were suggested and under which employees might be sent home. One, they behave in some activity that might be potentially unsafe outside the work environment. You made it clear you can't really police that, but you can't ask them about that. And say you tell them, well, you're, you're going to be in quarantine. Are you obligated to pay the worker during that period? And what if the worker says to the firm, look, even the firm that has made a good faith effort and is abiding by all the local and national laws with respect to social distancing, maintaining a safe work environment, the worker said, I just don't feel safe in coming in. And the worker doesn't come in. Is the firm still on the hook for paying the worker in either of those two situations? So it's going to depend on what 
where you are located and the size of your workforce. Right now, if you have fewer than 500 employees, you are subject to a federal law called the Fed Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provides for paid leave for employees up to two weeks at their regular rate of pay for their own illness or quarantine, and up to two-thirds pay if it's because of a family member's illness or quarantine, and if they're unable to work due to childcare reasons related to COVID, such as their daycare, children's daycare schools has been shut down and they don't have child care up to 12 weeks at two-thirds of their regular rate of pay. Um, other juris some jurisdictions have passed what are called supplemental paid sick leave laws. For example, if you're in Los Angeles or certain parts of the Bay Area in California, um, they have passed additional laws providing for two weeks of paid sick leave for essential workers who work for employers who are too big to be subject to that uh, federal law if they have more than 500 employees. And then many states and local jurisdictions have paid sick leave. Um, again, if you make it expensive for employees to stay home, they're not going to stay home. They will power through it. They will tell you they don't have symptoms. They won't share their circumstances. So even if you're not obligated to, it's probably worth the investment in additional, we, we've been calling it pandemic sick leave, to cover employees who have to stay home for one of those who have symptoms to incentivize them to let you know when they can't work because of an illness. Okay. Because if we drive right. it around, they will come in and infect others. Okay, great. Thank, thanks. That, that's, uh, that's very useful. Uh, there's a lot to think about there as well, uh, both <laughs> legal concerns and the risk uh, consequences of the compensation policies, as you mentioned. I think we have a, uh, the next slide, or maybe, yeah, so we have a slide. We actually asked in our survey that I talked about at the outset, um, we did ask about what companies are doing. Uh, in, in an effort to control labor costs. And, uh, you know, a substantial fraction, nearly half, were just, just monitoring the situation and trying to figure out what they're going to do and what should they do. Uh, not surprisingly, there were uh, sizable numbers of firms, about a quarter that had frozen headcount, another quarter that had already implemented uh, permanent reductions in forces, forces uh, reductions in force, and then some that had, uh, had more temporary layoffs and pay cuts. So there's a wide variety of strategies that uh, our survey participants have been following uh, in an effort to try to get a handle on, on their labor costs. And let, let's, let's move over to the, sec the next question now for our panelists. So what do you foresee as having the biggest impact on workforce productivity, good or bad, in the coming months? And, and, and here I want to turn to Adriano to kick it off. We haven't heard from him yet, and I'm sure he's got lots of good insights to share. Uh, so Adriano, take it away. Oh, sure. I, well, thank you very much. So uh, when, I, when I look at the productivity issue and I look at some of the clients that I've been working with, I think the, a couple of the issues or really three of the issues are the technology part of it, the, the culture part of it, as, as well as the fear factor part of it. So from a technology standpoint, it's really important to, to make certain that everyone has the technology in order to be able to interact with each other. And if you, if you have a collaborative culture where where by design or by necessity you've been collaborating, it's, it's easier for that for that company or those those individuals to continue to collaborate uh, while they're not in the office together. Um, if if you don't have that, then you have to you have to you have to input the technology in order to do that. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, there's a law firm in Chicago that uh, within within two weeks of of the of the virus of, of the of COVID. Uh, within two weeks, they basically shut down their offices, and everybody in the firm, especially especially the essential administrative people, uh, received new computers in order to collaborate with the with the partners of the firm and anybody else that needed to. Now, the challenge is there are some companies that just don't have the capital in order to do that, and so that's where you're going to find the challenge, and that's where some of the benefits of something like Zoom or some of what we're on right now, a webinar. Uh, allows allows some companies to to interact and be able to do that. The fear factor is 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 uh, especially when it comes to the hourly workforce and especially when they go back to engage. Are they ready to do that? Uh, medical practices are a perfect example. My wife has a, a rather rather a large periodontal practice, and we have seen that with with these periodontal practices that that there, there, there's been some fear in terms of coming back in because obviously there's still airborne pathogens, those types of issues that are, that, that, are, that you know, that exists. So um, 
that's the biggest challenge I think in terms of the uh, in terms of the hourly. Um, um, and, yeah, that's okay. That, that thank you for that, Adriano. We l let me turn to the other panelists. Um, and Jacob, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, and maybe you can speak to the innovation side impact of the pandemic as well as just the impact on near product near term productivity. Yeah, sure, uh, Steve. So you know, so our company it's more on the manufacturing side. So the biggest impacts or challenges that I do see in the coming months are really related to how do we maintain effective communication among our workers or engineers or, 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 or you know, floor workers, and as well as the team synergy. So what I mean by that is that, look, uh, we have been working effectively, uh, you know, via video conferencing, you know, in most of cases. However, we, as well as operation, as we are building products, we need our manufacturers or laborers to be there, basically building them. Uh, in addition, since we're a technology and engineering firm, we must take into consideration uh, that in the longer term, we need people to be working together in the office. Uh, engineers, you know, team synergy is critical for engineers. Uh, so when our engineers, uh, they need to work together in our labs and also design centers, and they need to explore different ideas to create innovation. I mean, uh, a person sitting home, uh, sitting in a computer, it's difficult to come up with those kind of innovation when he, got, he doesn't have the necessary equipment to, to, to work with. So for us, you know, in the short term, we, we can, you know, work through. But in the longer term, we need people to be in the office, work as a team, especially uh, engineers, you know, in particular designers to be able to uh, foster the, the creative solutions. Now, in addition, you know, uh, while much can be accomplished uh, virtually like we're doing right now, you know, I'm a people's person. I feel like you, you gain so much more by being in the room, be able to see each other, and, and be able to talk, you know, and that, that communication improvement, I think that can only be done so by face-to-face. By -face. Thank you. Thank, that's, that's interesting. And I, you know, that kind of rings true to me, too. I think of myself as being in the innov in an innovation industry, and it's really hard to replace the, the value of face-to-face -face interactions and in stimulating ideas and, and kind of cultivating the cross pollination of minds, um, Steve, Anthony, I'd, I'd like to get I'd like to get your perspective on on this uh, productivity question as well. Um, so please please take it away. Sure, sure. So uh, you know, as I mentioned, ABM again, uh, labor is our biggest cost driver. So utilizing technology both to track, retain, and deploy and manage that labor is critical. Um, so tools like onboarding tools, technology to expedite uh, the hiring of our front line to tools like ePay, which we have deployed, are critical for us to manage that labor force efficiently. Um, and outside of the front line, from a corporate standpoint, it's ensuring that we're set up correctly. Uh, no one, I think, you know, envisioned a pandemic where the work from home was going to be across uh, you know, the, the whole platform. Um, so while we had adequate steps in terms of our direct disaster recovery and business continuity, no one really expected it to be a full work from home uh, uh, scenario. Uh, so for us, it was ensuring that our team members had the right equipment to be efficient, that we were deploying collaboration technology tools to allow for uh, things like we're doing today, the face-to-face, -to -face, uh, and to the extent that uh, there's other technologies that we've deployed at the front line to make sure that we're connecting with that front line employee. Uh, it, it was critical for us. Um, so for us, it, it was a matter of ensuring both the front line had the technology and continued to use the technology to drive that productivity, as well as the back office ensuring that uh, we had deployed the, the right technology for that collaboration, which you know so so difficult uh, when it's remote at 100 percent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that, um, Michelle. Let's let in the in, to make sure we have enough time for the Q and A and to hear more from the panelists. Let's skip the next two slides that are about survey results and go to the next instant poll. Um, as you mentioned, um, we will be distributing these slides to the uh, participants in this webinar, so you'll get a chance to view all the slides. And I'm sorry, there's not enough time to go over through everything in, in detail, but I want to make sure we have time for the Q and A and and hear our panelists. So I'll let you take away the the next instant poll, Michelle.
Absolutely. Okay, so we'd like to learn what technology has helped you control productivity issues during this crisis. Has it been collaboration technology, like what we're on today, go to meetings, Zoom, etc.? Mm. E time and attendance technology. C learning management systems. D online HR technology, like you know, virtual onboarding your people, or not applicable E. And you can answer as many as you think are warranted. You don't have to just pick one. Okay, the results are coming in, Steve. Okay. All right. And we're going to close it. So it looks like 86%, of course, say collaboration technology, like we're using right now. 33% use time and attendance technology to be able to monitor uh, their workers. Mm -hmm and punching in and out and so on and screening. 19% used learning management for training and 26% for on, online virtual onboarding. And 7% said none of them were applicable. That's really interesting. I'm going to make two comments about this poll. First, the 86% one's not surprising, but uh, I did read in the Financial Times over the weekend that Zoom video has seen a $50 billion increase uh, in market cap. Uh, in the last few months. So there are companies out there that have benefited tremendously uh, from the pandemic and there are opportunities as well as lots of uh, minefields and costs and, uh, and demand shortfalls to worry about. The other thing that struck me, and I'm going to hear again, this is a personal note, on onboarding, virtual onboarding. Um, my oldest daughter just started a job, new job um, uh, two weeks ago entirely virtual. She's working for a software uh, technology company on a product design team. She doesn't expect to see any of your coworkers until September. It's really kind of an astonishing way to start a, a job, it seems to me, but uh, you know, we all have to make these adjustments. So let, let's turn to the next question, um, uh, Michelle. And um, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's, I think, a question on everybody's mind, uh, especially uh, in light of the kind of recent upsurge in COVID-19 cases in many, uh, many, um, Michelle, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, I don't see the screen anymore, but that's fine. Uh, okay. And if everybody else can see the screen, then, then we're good to go. Okay, there we are. Now I see the screen. I was worried it lost the connection, but that, uh, glad we have it. So, as I mentioned, there's this upsurge in COVID-19 cases in many states in the United States, and that kind of brings to front and center this really critical question is, well, what if we have a major second wave or a third wave? Or what if this just goes on for months and months without a vaccine? Uh, you know, so what steps are you taking uh, as business leaders to ensure that your business can continue successfully if COVID cases surge again? That's, that's really a huge question. And here, before we turn to the panelists, I do want to share uh, one last result from our survey because we because we asked businesses who participated in the survey uh, to address this question and here were the responses so um, so we said which of the following workforce areas of your business continuity planning does your company intend to review in the next three to six months uh, ensuring critical roles are covered by a succession plan 46 percent retention plans for critical talent that turns out to be uh, quite high, that shows up as 37%. So there are some employees who are viewed as quite critical for maintaining business continuity and you want to make sure you hold on to those folks. Um, and also interestingly, there's uh, an increased attention to the ability to swap employees across functions and, and tasks and assignments within an organization, which I guess makes sense when you think about it. Somebody might get sick, they play a critical role, uh, you have to have um, uh, some backup. Uh, for that contingency. So let me let me turn now um, uh, to our back to our panelists. And Jacob, I'm going to start with you this time, and uh, maybe ask you from an operational perspective, uh, in particular, um, what are you doing in the way of business continuity planning to prepare for the possibility that we have another major sur surge of COVID-19 cases? Yeah. Very good questions, and I think that the surge is already happening. You're seeing the, the number of cases is uh, hitting liquor high in a number of states today. So for us, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, we're actually adopting a strategy to leveraging our international manufacturing, you know, contract manufacturing facilities, 
with our own facilities in Arizona. So what we have been doing is to really a lot of these uh, major products are going to be shared or be, be able to build among either our CMs outside of U.S. or within our Arizona. So we're really taking steps to make sure that we have a backup plan or a succession plan where if we have to shut down Arizona, there will be product that we can still continue to build, you know, in China. Uh, for our international uh, backup plan, we're actually uh, already looking for a third contract manufacturers outside of China because China was the, you know, the, 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 the route when it first started. So there's always a chance. I mean, you see that they're already saying in, in Beijing, they're already seeing some, uh, a second wave. So to come back that, we're already actively looking for another CM outside of China uh, to be able to do that. We're also looking into ways to, to do that in the U.S. as well. So, so that's on, at the high level. You know, as far as the, you know, specifically to our facilities in Arizona, we, you know, uh, as mentioned earlier, we're introducing a second ship. We can e actually go to a third ship if needed. The key is to really uh, educate people, our employees, to understand the importance of wearing the mask. I think that wearing the mask really helps quite a bit in our case, right? Because, hmm. uh, you, you know, it's tough sometimes to make, make people aware of that six feet constantly, but to wear the mask, that, that really reduces quite a bit. And wash your hands often. So we follow the protocols uh, uh, strictly and, and just make people con conscious about uh, their social responsibility as well. Thank you, thank you, Jacob. So I, I take two points from you. One is diversify your supply chain, and two is robustify your plant level operations to minimize the risk of an outbreak. Um, Anthony, uh, let me ask you how you see it from a CFO perspective. Uh, this this business continuity, uh, the need for business continuity in the face of the COVID of another COVID surge. Yes. So you know, in my role, you know, primary responsibility for ensuring the liquidity of the company, as you can imagine. Um, so we took some preemptive measures prior to the peak of what you know, an unknown when this pandemic first uh, you know presented itself. And part of that was drawing preemptively on our credit facility. So we we ensured that we had cash on the balance sheet, and we were beginning the process of looking at you know, demand level forecast out and. Just so some context, our end markets are in some of the end markets that were impacted most severely, namely aviation, uh, education to a lesser extent. Uh, and then we have a large business and industry group, which is basically commercial uh, real estate as well as a tech and manufacturing group. So we, we looked at the end markets and preemptively we ensured that we had adequate liquidity on balance sheet. And through the process, we also renegotiated our credit facility to provide us a little bit more financial flexibility. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, we took cost actions to reduce our fixed costs um, while continuing to invest in critical areas to build up our inventory, uh, build up our supply inventory, as well as our um, fixed asset inventory to ensure that we can continue to service our clients that remained open during the pandemic. You know, we have a large manufacturing base uh, that remained open, so we wanted to make sure our frontline employees had the right equipment to service, that front, to service those clients as well as working very closely with our clients as they begin the reopening process. So for us, it was making sure we had the liquidity, we had the right supply chain, uh, to Jacob's point, uh, for the equipment and the supplies, and ensuring that we had a good understanding of that demand level because things have rapidly changed from, you know, as, as much as one week ago to one month ago, they're continually to evolve. So we want to stay nimble in our ability to respond to our clients' needs. Great, thank thank you, Anthony. That was very helpful, um, Adriano. Maybe you could you could take on this question from uh, the perspective of a company board member. You're serving on the board now. You've served on others in the past. Uh, give us your thoughts. Yes, and, and my first thought is always this is a board member's nightmare because <laughs> because uh, whether it's you know there's some issues that are different uh, when I was sitting on a public board versus a private board, but there's some that are very similar. And the financial risks can range anything from the forbearance issue, uh, which a lot of companies now have, have been able to uh, do that because of, uh, um, because, of, because, of, because of new laws, as and managing out of that. Because uh, what, what's the risk of managing out of that and how will COVID continue to affect that issue, especially if we talk about states like Arizona, Texas, places like that where all of a sudden it's arrived. 
but but more but more than that, and typically when you have a good management team, um, Anthony spoke to that. When you when you're managing when when you're doing that, then that that risk kind of goes away or is mitigated. But then there's then there's also the insurance insurance risk or the liability risks, and and the liability risks are more what you're talking about in terms of transmission risk and how that affects the entire workforce, and the insurance risk is how that how does that affect you know both both from a from an overall standpoint as well as from a legal standpoint, which Brooke's going to talk about all the legalities of this. Uh, how how will that affect how will that affect the organization and how do you work through all those issues? Uh, as you move forward. Um, one of the important things also is going back to somebody mentioned in the in the um, uh, uh, the which we call it in the in, in, in the survey is redundancies. Okay, one of the one of the easiest ways to work out of this is through redundancies and that's where an efficient and effective uh, um, long-term plan and an efficient and effective um, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm losing my words this morning. Um, business continuity plan is important. So, so hopefully an organization has created that, whether it be public or private, and they've been able to work through that business continuity plan and create those redundancies. If they haven't, then you know other issues lie ahead. Right. Great. Th thanks for that, Adriano. Um, Brooke, I want to turn. I want to go back to you. We've got three more minutes. Um, you talked about some of these issues earlier, but in listening to our discussion and recognizing the current surge in COVID cases in some parts. There's another question that occurs to me. Maybe you, maybe you want to speak to it, maybe you don't. But let's suppose that there is a COVID outbreak at one of your facilities, and there are costs um, that your workers bear, maybe even your customers and suppliers. Um, you know, what kind of legal risk do you face uh, in, in future litigation that might arise out of that? Uh, so it's not just the business continuity issues in the operational financial sense, but legally you can see I, meat packing companies come to mind because they've been in the news. You know, what can you speak to the legal risks there and what steps companies can take uh, to mitigate those risks? I will do my best to cover all that in three minutes. Um, so I'll give kind of a high I, level. I that on with no advance warning. So, That's so. Right. Um, so uh, the, the big thing is um, if employees get sick in your workplace, it is a legal problem for you. Uh, probably at least three times a day I'm asked, well, can't I just have my employees sign a waiver that they assume risk? You cannot do that with an employee. There's what's called the General Duties Clause. It's under OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, or administration, that might be what the A stands for, which is our federal agency that polices safety in the workplace. There are Some states have their own state level OSHAs as well. And it has what's called the general duties clause in it. And in plain English, it means employers have a general duty to create a safe workplace. So by asking employees, you, you assume the risk of getting COVID by coming to the workplace, you would be violating that. So that's one thing is that if employees get sick, you can't just ask them to assume the risk and, and waive any liability. In some states, that means that it's covered automatically by workers' comp. California um, presumes now that if you caught COVID within two weeks of being at your employer's work site, that it is covered by workers' <clears throat> comp rebut that, but it's presumed. Other states, it's open-ended. Um, I was just advising someone in Texas yesterday, and right now it's very unclear whether workers' comp would cover that. Now, the downside is you're in workers' comp, but the pro side is if you're in workers' comp, you're not in litigation. And we are seeing right now it's a trickle. I expect this to turn into a flood as more and more courts open, and this goes on a little longer, um, a flood of litigation where employees are saying, I was sent, I was required to come to work, I was not given any PPE, I was stacked elbow to elbow with my coworkers, and I caught COVID because my employer did not follow basic safety standards. They didn't socially distance us. They didn't follow CDC guidelines. They didn't follow state and local requirements regarding safety in the workplace. So this is, I think, going to be a huge area for litigation. And um, that's something that employers ask, well, how much do I have to worry about it if employees are, are sick or injured? I spelled this out to someone rather bluntly the other day, your employees could die from this. Yes, you do have to take it seriously. This is not an idle threat. And as we're seeing, it surges fairly quickly, especially as things open up. Um, Adriano said that this is a, a nightmare for board members. It's a nightmare for lawyers, too, because we love to plan. And you can't plan long, far in advance for this. And planning is really 
having a business continuity plan is essential, but as we saw back in March, especially here in California, you were given maybe an afternoon's notice to shut down. In the Bay Area, certain parts of Southern California, you were told with like six hours at like 4 p.m. you have to be shut down by midnight. If you weren't prepared to move fully online in that amount of time, it, it took a while to get back on your feet. As cases in surge, we can expect that the restrictions will be imposed in certain parts of the country. So what I've been saying is plan for this to not be linear. You're going to open up and you might have to scale back and open up again and scale back again um, and work with your employees on that and, you know, do the stuff needed to keep them safe. Thank, thank you for that. that, that that's a very sobering assessment. Uh, <laughs> that's so uh, uh, that's... Uh, I think I'm going to turn it back to Michelle now. Uh, maybe we have another instant poll before we go to the Q&A. Yeah, we do. All right, so we're going to go to q and uh, I'm going to give you a minute to put in some questions. We've got a couple that are there already, but um, please go ahead and type that in. While you're doing that, I just want to let you know about um, a complimentary offer that we can uh, are helping our customers with. It's basically helping them model workforce um, realignment. So we know that, you know, your labor force, you may be furloughing, laying off, then bringing back on, your sales are going up and down. Mm -hmm. um, our analytics team has built out a modeling tool that can help you put in what you think your projections are in terms of sales and then um, play with your headcount so that you can see what your profitability might be. We are offering a complimentary workshop uh, where you just kind of give us some information. We'll ident identify some targeted areas that where you should really be watching metrics and maybe some ideas. And then um, if you wish to, you can give us some of your numbers and we'll plug it in. Again, complimentary so that you can take a look at, at the tool and maybe get some initial insight from the tool um, initially. So uh, if you are interested in that and would like to know more about our, again, it's a complimentary offer. If you just want to try to help here, um, just let us know. Uh, I think they're going to open up the polls and you can just say yes or no. So, uh, all right, let's get back to the questions then. So, all right, so Steve, let me just open up my question box. So we've got a few coming in here. Um, I'm going to summarize. This is from Mary Johnson, and uh, Mary is a client of ePace. And just want to say uh, what she's basically saying is that with this summer events and where she's located, they can't reopen at all. So it's really looking like next year. What type of obligations are we expected to handle with respect to her, uh, their laid off staff? Um, if they're not able to open, what happens once the unemployment benefits run out? Okay, that, that's not, I take that to be a question mostly about legal obligations. I think so. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn that over to Brooke and let's see what she has to say about that. Sure. Um, it's a little hard to answer without knowing where she's located because a lot of this is driven at the state level. So I'm going to speak kind of generally. Um, if you anticipate not, if you anticipate being closed for more than six months, federal law requires that a temporary layoff that turn that goes for a long term is subject to the WARN Act, and that's the WARN stands for the Worker Adjustment Retraining and Notification Act. Plain English means we give 60 days notice to employees that we expect a layoff to happen and to go for a longer term. Many states have their own WARN acts as well. For example, California has one, um, and it varies depending on the number of employees that you have. If you're on this, um, if you have more than 50 employees who would be affected by a layoff, for example, um, often this law will apply. So the WARN Act is part of that. Um, there are pretty stiff penalties for not complying with it. And as I touched on a little earlier, if you know, it's foreseeable. It was not foreseeable back in March. It's a bit more foreseeable now and harder to make that argument. So if you have a temporary furlough that turns into a longer term layoff, likely that federal law will come into play if you didn't already comply with it. With regard to when the unemployment benefits run out, if your employees are furloughed and you expect them to return, um, like I said, it's going to depend on each state. There's a federal supplement of employment benefits right now that is expected to run, that's currently going to run out at the end of July unless Congress extends it. No, don't know yet if that's going to happen or if it'll be extended in the same way. Um, if you're subject to the Paycheck Protection Program, um, 
again, there's some talk that it could be extended or modified or the SBA loans, all those things could come into play with it. Your obligations to employees, though, just from an employee relations standpoint, is to communicate with them. And if you are, what I've been saying is don't promise that this is short term if you can't make that promise. Um, if you're carrying benefits for them while they're out on leave, make sure that you're allowed to do that if their hours fall below a certain number over the course of a year. Some, some benefits programs by law will drop members from it if they don't work a certain number of hours. Now, anecdotally, I'm hearing most benefits providers are willing to work with employers on this, but there are some laws that come into play that could affect that. Um, if their employment benefits, if their unemployment benefits run out because there's no work for them, as an employer, there's not an obligation to continue to pay legally, but you may want to keep them on the books or keep them employed, maybe at reduced hours. Um, some employers are com are only bringing in their employees for, say, 10 hours a week to allow them to continue to work and earn some sort of income while they're out on unemployment. Others are converting their exempt employees to non-exempt to allow them to pay less, but it would allow them to stay employed. Um, it's This is unfortunately not an area of law, the law that often rewards creativity, but this is the one time where we're thinking, this might be the time to get creative. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Another question that I think um, I the panel the the person that asked the question probably would like to hear from all of you. Um, what would you say if an employee asks you if they can continue to work from home indefinitely as they've done so for the last four months? How do you handle that? You want to take that one quickly, Jacob, to start with? I, I think I have a sense of what you might say, but let's hear it from you. Okay, you put, put me in a tough spot here, huh? You know, look, uh, I think that it has to be, if an employee is asking, hey, I've been doing this thing for a while now, could I do this thing permanently? I think that, first of all, it's looking into the, this individual's job function, right? For me, if it's in the finance side, in the marketing side, maybe they have has a less impact you know, and be able to still work effectively. The key here is about productivity. Can this person still do the job effectively by working remotely? If the answer is yes, I'm inclined to be more lenient. If the answer is that it's going to present a, a challenge, not only to the company, but to the rest of the peer, uh, you don't want to be the person that's impacting the team members. So I would like to take all of that into consideration before saying, okay, that's doable or that's not. So it's really based on case by case. And I have to understand why. Do you want to stay home just because you want to stay home? Or, or for other reasons that you got, you know, kids at home that you got to have to take care of. Uh, but so, so all of those have to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. How about you, Anthony? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, the, you know, one of the things we, we really didn't address um, is culture. Um, it's very hard. You, know, you mentioned your daughter. Uh, joining a company and doing it virtually and starting out where you know she's not going to potentially interact with her coworkers until September and that may you know maybe uh, delay it even further. So one of the things that we want to make sure is that the culture that we've built um, for the staff and management over the past couple of years, we continue uh, to embrace that culture and we continue to utilize the technology because for the time being uh, everything is virtual to make sure that we are able to continue what is very important for us from a cultural standpoint. Um, so for, we're looking at it case by case. Uh, we recognize that in certain situations, to Jacob's point, if there's family needs that require an individual to work from home on a, a more prolonged basis, we're going to work uh, accordingly. But you know, we're also um, you know keeping that cultural aspect of you know what you build when you're face to face and making sure that we don't lose sight of that in the long term. Thank you. And Adriano, any you know, other I, thoughts on this matter? I, I definitely agree with both Jacob and Anthony. I mean, it is a combination of how do you maintain the culture and how do you ma maintain the communication and what's, what, what, what kind of cog in the wheel is that person? Um, and that goes back to, you know, why are they doing that? Is it a fear factor of, of, of COVID or something of that nature? I do know that some people now do have challenges with their with their children and they don't see the they don't see what you know what's what's going forward in terms of school and things of that nature so I, I can understand that um, I think though that sometimes uh, what somebody has to understand is is that if you decide to work from home is that that might it might it might 
not get you up the corporate ladder as quickly as, as the people who are working together because there is no interaction with the others who are working in the organization in the office. So that's one of the, you know, one of the drawbacks of that, I think. So. Michelle, I'll, I'll, let, let me say two things about this. This is, this is actually an active area of research for me, and uh, I've been conducting surveys of both uh, workers and, and businesses about uh, work from home and what they expect to happen, what they want to happen. On the worker side, one striking thing is um, very few people want to work from home five days a week. Many people would like to work from home one or two days a week, and it's almost uniform across the uh, wage distribution, uh, whereas the opportunity to work from home are very far from uniform across the wage distribution. They tend to be much greater uh, in the upper parts of the wage distribution than people in the lower parts of the wage distribution. On the business side, what we see is in some respects compatible. Very few businesses expect to ship many of their employees to full-time, uh, five days a week working from home. Many do say that they expect, as a consequence of the social experiment they've engaged in right now, to shift to a model where many of their employees work from home one or two days a week. And I just put a single number on this. Uh, we estimate that about one-fifth of all office worker days in business offices and often in central cities will shift off the business premises after the pandemic's over, not right now, but after that pandemic's over compared to what the situation was before it struck. So this work from home shift, I think, is going to be a profound one. Interesting. If I could just jump in with a just couple of quick considerations on the legalities uh, regarding work from home. I mean, during the pandemic, it should be encouraged as often as possible just from an infection control standpoint. Once this is over, and it will be over at some point, um, bear in mind that it will be difficult to put, kind of what Dr. Davis was mentioning a second ago, it's going to be difficult to put this genie back in the bottle. Because if an employee comes to you later and says, I want to work from home because I have a medical condition where I need to work from home, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to say you can't perform the job remotely when they've just spent months or maybe or a year performing the job remotely. And so um, it's very important to have a very good, detailed, up-to-date job description because when you're accommodating an employee making such a request, um, it's important to look at what are the essential functions. And to clarify right now, and I've written a number of these policies for employers, that this working from home, you're not able to perform all your essential functions remotely, but we're doing it anyway because maybe our business is required to be shut down or you know what have you, and that this is just for this reason. But typically, you cannot perform all of your essential duties from home, and it's important to do that. But know that it will be harder to make that argument even after the pandemic's over. The other is to ensure that even if it – to make sure that you do have equal opportunity for promotion because people will have to work remotely due to childcare reasons, due to medical reasons, they can't be around other people. And if that has a disparate impact, for example, childcare does disparately impact women. Um, health concerns do disparately impact people with disabilities. Um, to make sure that promotion decisions aren't are not being made to the extent that it's excluding people like that from moving up the corporate ladder or from continuing to work and to just keep those EEO, those equal employment and opportunity considerations in mind. Thank, thank you, Brooke. Thanks for that. Uh, Michelle, I turn it back to you, and I think you're going to wrap up for us. I am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis, uh, Steve. Thank you, all of, all of you. There was a lot of questions coming in, and we could not get to them. I'm sorry. But what we'll, we'll try to do is we'll talk to the panelists and see if we can get their thoughts and get them written up. Because as I did say, we are going to send you the slides and the executive summary of the research that Steve has, has been talking about throughout the session. Um, so thank you, all, all of you, for that. Um, I just, again, want to wrap up. Uh, and, and let you know too, we would love to talk to you more about some of the things that you are struggling with, um, specifically when it comes to looking at managing your workforce, tracking your time, schedules, labor, and then of course the whole human capital experience from applicant tracking, human resources, management, benefit management, uh, uh, payroll and, and learning management systems. We, we do it all, but again, we really focus on those companies that have that workforce that is um, got some pretty complex pay rules and some pay agreements and things like that going on that they really need to track. Um, and that's where we excel. 
if you happen to be in the market, just let us know. We'd love to talk to you. You can answer right here on your poll. We'd appreciate it, um, whether it's a, a full suite of human capital management solution or if you're looking and really scratching your head about your current time and attendance system, maybe it didn't give you the features that you needed to do screening when people punch in and out through this, this tough time or the visibility that you need or the reporting you need. We, we encourage you to take a look at us. This is the area where we shine. All right. So once again, wrapping up, thank you, Adriano, Anthony, Brooke, and Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us. What great insight that you have given to everybody. And also, of course, Dr. Davis, thank you, too. Um, and we appreciate all of the thoughts. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great hour. Of course, I also want to thank our sponsors. We do have, do a webinar series throughout the year. Um, uh, now that we, we know who you are, you will get an invitation once in a while to a webinar, so we encourage you to join us. Um, but thank you to Talent Rise, Dwayne Morris, which is Brooks Firm, and HCMI, uh, our analytics partner in terms of uh, uh, sponsoring and, and supporting our webinars. So thank you very much. If you need more information and help, please know that we do have a COVID-19 resource page. You will see the, um, any information and this ex the executive summary of these results and links to this webinar, plus lots of other federal and individual state things going on that you need to, to um, keep informed on. A lot of our customers use this. Uh, it is open to everybody, so please check it out. Just go to our webpage, click on the resources, and you'll see the COVID-19 resource. Uh, option up there. So again, my name is Michelle Lanter Smith from ePay Systems and all of our panelists and our great moderator, Dr. Stephen Davis from the University of Chicago Blue School of Business. Thank you very much. We ask our customer advisor board to stay with us, stay on the line. To the rest of you, thank you for this hour and be safe. Be healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.